Welcome to Julia for Talented Amateurs, where I make wholesome Julia tutorials for talented amateurs everywhere. I am your host, the Dabbling Doggo. I dabble. If you are a returning subscriber, welcome back, and Happy New Year! I hope that you and your family had a restful holiday season. If you're new to the channel, welcome! On this channel, I make Julia tutorials for amateurs, hobbyists, tinkerers, and enthusiasts. This video is the first in a new 13-part series that will introduce analysis and visualization using the Julia programming language. This series is intended for those who already have a basic understanding of Julia, but are new to analysis. New videos will be posted on Sundays. Have you ever seen the movie Johnny Mnemonic? It's a pretty bad movie that came out in 1995. It stars Keanu Reeves before he did The Matrix. It's a science fiction movie set in the year 2021, which just happens to be this year. It's interesting to see how we imagined the future just a few years ago. In this imaginary world, Keanu Reeves plays a character with a cybernetic brain implant designed to store information. This brain implant allows him to upload data directly into his brain, and thus allowing him to discreetly deliver confidential information that is considered too sensitive to send over the internet. For some reason, this movie is very specific about the storage capacity of his brain implant. According to the movie, his brain implant has a storage capacity of 80 gigabytes. In order to accept one final, shady deal, he gets an upgrade which doubles his capacity to 160 gigabytes. Unfortunately, he finds out that the amount of data he needs to carry is 320 gigabytes, so the overflow data is leaking from his implant directly into his brain, causing severe pain. And, unless he can extract the data within a few days, he will die. <laughs> 1995 was the dawn of the internet. Google would be founded three years later in 1998. YouTube would be founded 10 years later in 2005. Back in 1995, 320 gigabytes of portable data was considered enormous, suitable only for bad science fiction movies. In the 1990s, files were shared using a 3.5 inch floppy disk cartridge, which held about 1 megabyte of data. Today, you can put 1 terabyte of data onto a portable flash drive, which is three times the amount that Keanu Reeves' character was carrying in his brain, and 1 million times the amount that we could store on a floppy disk in the 1990s. The point being, the amount of data being generated and stored today is accelerating at a pace that was unthinkable just a few years ago. From online purchases to social media interactions, we cannot avoid data in our modern life. Even if you are not a data scientist, you will need to evaluate data at some point, whether it's for work or for personal reasons. Those who can assess the data will have an advantage. Those who cannot will be at the mercy of those who can. The traditional tools used to evaluate data, like spreadsheets, are no longer sufficient to handle the volume, the variety, or the velocity of data that surround us today. Both professionals and private citizens need to learn a programming language that is capable of analyzing complex data sets for their own peace of mind. Regardless, if the source of the data is your employer, your government, or the media, you should never trust curated statistics at face value. Instead, you should try to find the raw data and learn how to perform your own analysis, so you can come to your own conclusions. If you are new to analysis, Julia is a great place to begin. This is not a Julia for Beginners tutorial series. I am assuming that you have a basic understanding of Julia syntax and semantics. We will not be doing a lot of programming in this series. Instead, we'll be using a lot of different Julia packages to help us with our analysis. However, a general understanding of how Julia works is required. If you are looking for a Julia for Beginners tutorial series, I have provided a link in the description below to my Julia for Beginners tutorial series playlist. This analysis tutorial series is not intended for professional data scientists. If you are a data scientist, you are certainly welcome here, but I suspect that my tutorial series will be too slow for you. Instead, I would recommend checking out one of Julia's official videos for data analysis professionals. If you would like an overview of Julia's data analysis tools ecosystem, Watch David Antow's video on the subject. If you would like a comprehensive tutorial series specifically for data scientists, watch Huda Nassar's video series. If you just want to learn how to use the Data Frames package, watch Bogomil Kaminsky's video series. Links to all of these videos are provided in the description below. 
However, if you have a basic understanding of Julia and have never done any analysis, then stick to my tutorial series. I am not a data scientist. I am not a computer scientist. I do not have a PhD. I am not affiliated with the Julia programming language or with Julia computing. I am a self-taught hobbyist who likes to learn new skills. Julia is my first programming language and it's the only programming language that I know. I've been using Julia for about nine months now and I like Julia because it's fun and it's free. I learned Julia for free by watching YouTube videos. I started this YouTube channel as a way of giving back to the online teaching community that gave me so much for free without asking for anything in return. It is my hope to help others like me who are new to Julia and by doing so to help myself gain a better understanding of the material through teaching. And it's not all serious. It's also my hope that we can have some fun along the way. For the rest of today's video, we're going to set up our programming environment and then take a quick look at the Iris dataset, which is like the hello world of data analysis. For this tutorial series, we'll be using Microsoft's Visual Studio Code, or VS Code for short, as our programming environment. If you watched my first tutorial series, you know that we used Atom and that I wasn't exactly positive towards VS Code. However, as much as I like Atom, the reality is that the Julia community is migrating away from Atom to VS Code. I finally come to accept that reality, so one of my New Year's resolutions for 2021 is to learn how to use VS Code. The good news is that if you already know how to use Atom, then it will make switching over to VS Code a lot easier. While Atom may be great for beginners, it's also buggy and slow. And since no one's working to improve it anymore, it's never going to get it any better. VS Code is noticeably faster than Atom, and it's good for data analysis. Improvements are being made, so if there's something that you don't currently like about it, there's at least a chance that it will be improved in the future. On the flip side, it's still relatively new, so not everything works yet. For example, there's no documentation browser in the Julia extension for VS Code. It's kind of like moving into a house while it's still under construction. Let's start by creating some folders where we can save our files. You can save them anywhere, but I will be saving my files onto my desktop. If you haven't done so already, create a desktop folder called My Julia Files. Double click on My Julia Files. Create a folder called Series 01. Move all of your files from the first tutorial series into that folder. Create another folder called Series 02. This is the folder where we'll save all of our files from this tutorial series. You can, of course, name these folders whatever you like and save them wherever you like. I'm assuming that you already know how to install and update Julia, but for completeness, I will speed through a clean installation of the latest version of Julia for this tutorial series. As of this recording, the latest release is Julia version 1.5.3. In your web browser, do a search for VS Code. Go to the Visual Studio Code website, and it should auto-detect your operating system. Click on the blue button to download VS Code. After the download is complete, install VS Code. Before you accept the license agreement, be sure to read it, especially Section 2A about data collection and Section 2B about processing of personal data. I will show you how to disable the telemetry reporting after we install VS Code, but it's important to understand that unlike Adam's license, the VS Code license is not open source. Instead, it's a Microsoft license. VS Code is free, but as is the case with a lot of free software, the catch is that rather than paying with your cash, you're paying with your data. If you're okay with the license, go ahead and accept the agreement and go to the next step. Click Next to select Destination Location. Click Next to select Start Menu Folder. Check the box to create a desktop icon and click Next. Click Install to install VS Code. Click Finish to launch VS Code. When you launch VS Code, you should be greeted by a welcome screen. Uncheck the box for Show Welcome Page on Startup. Close the dialog box to help Microsoft. Let's start by installing some VS Code extensions. 
Click on the extensions icon on the left side toolbar. It's the one with the four squares, with one square being offset. Search for Julia and install the Julia extension version 1.0.10. You should see a new icon with the Julia logo appear below the extensions icon. Search for Atom 1 Dark Theme and install version 2.2.3. In the top middle dialog box, select Atom 1 Dark as the color theme. Search for Bracket Pair Color Razor 2 and install version 0.2.0. Close the Extensions menu by clicking on the Extensions icon again. Close the Bracket Pair Colorizer 2 tab to reveal an empty workspace. Next, let's configure the user interface. Start by clicking on the Explorer icon on the left side toolbar. The Explorer icon is the icon that looks like two documents on top of each other. Click on the blue Open Folder button. Select the Series 2 folder on your desktop. Close the Explorer by re-clicking on the Explorer icon. Create a new file by going to File, New File. Save the file as Tutorial 02 by 01.jl by going to File, Save As. You can find the .jl file extension by scrolling all the way down to the bottom. If you'd like to help the Julia team improve the Julia extension, agree to let them collect your data. Otherwise, just close the dialog box. Go to View, Command Palette, and search for Julia Show Plot and select it. A new panel should appear next to your text editor. Go back to View, Command Palette, and search for Julia Start REPL and select it. The REPL should show up at the bottom of the screen. Test the REPL by typing in print line hello world and one plus one. Click on the Julia icon on the left side toolbar to reveal the workspace panel. This workspace panel contains a lot more detail than the one in Atom. However, the location is not very convenient, so let's move it. Click and drag the top bar and move it to the right of the REPL. Adjust the panel as necessary by left-clicking and dragging the vertical bar. Close the Explorer by clicking on the Explorer icon. With Atom, I really didn't have to change any of the default settings. However, with VS Code, my personal experience is that some of their default settings need to be modified. These modifications are optional. Also, you may have to adjust these settings depending on your monitor resolution. In case you're interested, here are my settings. Go to File, Preferences, Settings to make the modifications. You need to make the changes in both User and Workspace settings. Under Text Editor, find Match Brackets. Change the option to Never. Also under Text Editor, find Parameter Hints. Uncheck that box. Also under Text Editor, find Rulers. This one's a little different. You have to click on that link to edit in settings.json. Type in 80 or 80, and the close bracket should show up automatically. You have to save this file separately by going to File, Save. And then you can close this tab. Under Text Editor, find the Font section. Change that to 15. Also under the Text Editor, find the Minimap section and change the Max Column to 80. Also under the Text Editor, under Suggestions, find Accept Suggestions on Enter and turn that off. Under Application, find the Telemetry section and uncheck that box where it says Enable Telemetry. So those are all the setting changes under User. Now you have to repeat that for the workspace.
close the Settings tab. On my monitor, the user interface is difficult to see. Fortunately, VS Code allows you to zoom in the entire user interface. Go to View, Appearance, Zoom In. Repeat as necessary. Adjust the panel bars as necessary. On my screen, the editor takes up roughly 75% of the horizontal space, and the plots panel is roughly a square. In VS Code, there are a lot of keyboard shortcuts, also known as key bindings. For some reason, the key binding to run a block of code is Alt-Enter, and not Shift-Enter like in Adam. Shift-Enter in VS Code runs the entire file, which you generally want to avoid. You can swap these key bindings by going to File, Preferences, Keyboard Shortcuts. Search for Julia Execute. Select the Edit Pen icon to the left of Julia Execute Code and Move. Hold down Shift and Enter in the dialog box, and then hit Enter to accept. You can disregard that warning. Select the Edit Pen icon to the left of Julia Execute Code Cell and Move. Hold down Alt and Enter in the dialog box, and then hit Enter to accept. You can disregard that warning. Close the Keyboard Shortcuts tab. At this point, close VS Code and relaunch it to make sure that all of the modifications have been applied. Most of your settings should have been saved. To see the Plots pane again, go to View Command Palette. There, you should see your most recent selections. Select Julia Show Plot. Same thing for the REPL. Open up the Command Palette again by going to View Command Palette. Select Julia Start REPL. In the REPL, type in Exit to close the REPL. If you go back up to View Command Palette, you'll see there's a key binding to start the Julia REPL, which is Alt J and then Alt O. Click in the terminal and type in Alt J and then Alt O. This is how I'll be starting the REPL for the remainder of the tutorial series. As you may have guessed, there are key bindings to close out the Julia REPL as well. Rather than typing in exit, you can use Alt-J and then Alt-K. Reopen the REPL by using Alt-J then Alt-O. Another way to close the REPL is by using Ctrl-D as in Delta. This is how I will be closing out the REPL for the remainder of the tutorial series. Now reopen the REPL again by using Alt-J, then Alt-O. Now we're ready to take a look at the IRIS dataset. The IRIS dataset is like the Hello World of Data Analysis tutorials. The IRIS Flower dataset is from a 1936 paper by the British statistician and geneticist Sir Ronald Fisher. The actual measurements were recorded by Edgar Anderson, who was an American botanist working with Ronald Fisher and some others under a fellowship in 1929. The dataset is sometimes referred to as either Fisher's IRIS dataset or Anderson's IRIS dataset. Ronald Fisher had some controversial personal views, which have resurfaced in recent years. I won't say any more about it, other than to state a disclaimer that my use of the IRIS dataset in no way endorses the opinions of Ronald Fisher. I'm only using the IRIS dataset because it's a widely used dataset to introduce the subject of computational analysis. The dataset contains 150 records under five attributes, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and species. There are three species of the iris flower that are recorded in this dataset, Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. There are 50 records for each species. Most people know what a flower petal is, but a flower sepal is not as commonly known. The petal is the part that points up, while the sepal is the part that falls down. Based on this data set, Ronald Fisher developed a statistical model so that he could classify the different species given just four measurements without actually having to see the physical flower. Like Hello World, 
working on the IRIS dataset provides a non-scientific, qualitative way to evaluate how easy or how difficult it is to perform analysis using a particular programming language. If it's easy to perform analysis on the IRIS dataset in that language, then it's a sign that it may be easy to perform analysis on other datasets as well. Conversely, if it's difficult to perform analysis on the IRIS dataset in that language, then it may be a red flag that performing analysis in that language may be difficult for other datasets as well. Let's jump into VS Code and perform our own analysis on the IRIS dataset using Julia. You can expand the REPL to fill your screen by clicking on the up arrow in the upper right corner of the terminal panel. Click in the REPL and enter the close bracket to enter the package REPL. Adding these packages may take a while, so plan accordingly. Type in status to verify the version information of the packages that you just added. As of this recording, these are the latest versions of the package. For Data Voyager, the latest release is version 1.0.0. For Vega Datasets, the latest release is version 2.1.0. For Vega Lite, the latest release is version 2.3.0. Exit the package REPL by hitting Backspace. You can collapse the REPL by clicking on the down arrow in the upper right corner of the terminal panel. Click in the open text editor to start coding. Typing in the comments are optional. Select all three rows and hit Shift Enter. I selected the rows by using the up arrow to get to the top and then held down the Shift key while using the down arrow to get to the bottom. For this tutorial series, I will try to use the keyboard as much as possible while coding. This may take a while to pre-compile and index. Once complete, load the IRIS dataset from the Vega datasets package. In the editor, be sure the code that you just ran is no longer highlighted before typing again. Select the row and hit Shift Enter. Vega Datasets contains some datasets that you can use to practice putting your analytic skills to use. For a list of the available datasets, go to their GitHub page and click on the data folder, and then again on another data folder. In order to load any of those datasets, simply replace IRIS with any of those data files without using the file extensions. Go back to VS Code and try to look at the output in the REPL. You can expand the REPL by clicking on the up arrow. As you can see, the REPL does not display the entire dataset. It displays the first few rows and then omits the rest. Viewing data in the Julia REPL is not a great experience. Minimize the REPL by clicking on the down arrow. Fortunately, the clever folks who created the Julia extension for VS Code have also created a nice utility to generate a grid viewer to display tabular data. You can invoke it by using the VS Code display function and using the variable name of your dataset as the argument. The VS Code display function is unique to VS Code, so it won't work on other programming environments. Select the row and hit Shift Enter. A new tab should open up showing the data. You can scroll through the data to see the different species. All of the numbers in this data set are measurements in centimeters. You can click on the header name to sort the data from low to high. Click on the header name again to sort the data from high to low. Click on the header name for a third time and the dataset goes back to the original unsorted order. Try it now for all the header names. So, quickly scanning through the data, what can we learn? There are three different species named Setosa, 
Versicolor, and Virginica. The sepal length ranges from 4.3 cm to 7.9 cm. The sepal width ranges from 2 cm to 4.4 cm, so about half the sepal length. The petal length ranges from 1 cm to 6.9 cm, so the petal length is shorter than the sepal length, but it has a much wider range. The petal width ranges from 0.1 cm to 2.5 cm, which is about the same range as the sepal width, but the petal width is much thinner, with the skinniest petal being just 1 mm. Looking at the data in a table is helpful, but it's difficult to understand the relationship between the different attributes and the different species. It would be helpful to generate a plot, or plots, so we can better understand the data set. A quick way to visualize data that is already in a table is to use the Data Voyager package. I'll go into more detail about Data Voyager in a future video, but for now, I'll just give a quick demonstration of how to use it. You can invoke the Data Voyager user interface by using the Voyager function and using the variable name of your dataset as the argument. Note that the Voyager function has an uppercase V. Select the row and hit Shift Enter. A separate window should pop up with several automatically generated plots. Data Voyager has evaluated your dataset and is recommending some different plots to help you explore your data. There's a plot showing that there are 50 records for each of the three species. The rest of the plots are histograms that show the distribution of the four numeric attributes. This may or may not be what you are looking for. Another quick way to explore your data is to drag and drop some of the fields under the data column and move them to the encoding column. Start by dragging and dropping the quantitative fields box from the wildcard fields to the box for the x-axis under the encoding column. The result is a series of one-dimensional strip plots. It basically shows the same range for the data that we just looked at in the table. However, in addition to showing the range, it also shows the frequency for each measurement. The darker the line, the higher the frequency, so you can quickly get a sense for where the average measurements might fall. You can choose the quantitative fields again from the wildcard fields, but now drag and drop it to the y-axis box. Now you should see several different scatter plots comparing two different attributes to each other in two dimensional plots. These scatter plots are more helpful since you can easily see the relationship between the attributes. As the petal gets longer, the petal gets wider. As the petal gets longer, the sepal also gets longer, but with a tighter range. As the petal gets longer, the sepal width can either be wider or narrower, which is curious. As the petal gets wider, the sepal gets longer, which we already know from the first two plots. As the petal gets wider, the sepal width can either be wider or narrower. This is similar to the third plot. As the sepal gets longer, the sepal does get wider, but in an unexpected way. Unlike the first plot, which shows a clear relationship between petal length and petal width, the relationship between sepal length and sepal width is a little more complicated. In order to understand this data better, it would be helpful if we could add the species information to see if there's a difference by species. You can add a so-called third dimension to these plots by dragging and dropping species to the color box. These plots are still technically 2D plots, but since they display three different attributes, they are sometimes referred to as three-dimensional plots. You can also drag species to either size or shape, but I think color gives you the best visualization. Now you should see the same six scatter plots but showing the different species in different colors. You can hover over the data points to reveal the actual data. What can we see in these plots? It looks like there's a clear separation with the Satosa species. Of the three different species, it has the shortest petal length and the thinnest petal width. However, when it comes to the sepal, there's some overlap in the sepal length, and its sepal is surprisingly wide. In fact, it has the widest sepal width. It looks like there's some overlap between the Versicolor and Virginica species, 
But in general, it looks like the Virginica species is the largest, with the longest petal, widest petal, and longest sepal. However, its sepal width is not all that different from the Versicolor species. So, just based on these plots, it looks like petal length, petal width, and sepal length are good attributes to use to separate the different species, while sepal width may not be as good. Let's say we want to use the plot showing the relationship between petal length and petal width and use it in a presentation. How would we export that plot? Go to that plot and select it by clicking on the Specify button. Doing so will generate more plots that Data Voyager thinks are related. Go back to VS Code. Select the row, then hit Shift Enter. The V with the bracket syntax will access the currently active plot in your Voyager window. Note that this V is lowercase. The plot that you specified in Data Voyager should now appear in your plot panel. Select the row and hit Ctrl C to copy. On the next row, hit Ctrl V to paste. Change the PNG file extension to SVG. Select both rows and hit Shift Enter. Go to your file manager and look in the Series 02 folder and open the PNG file. Zoom in and notice how bad the image looks. You clearly cannot use this file for a presentation. Now go back to the folder and look for the SVG file. You cannot use a standard image viewer to look at an SVG file, but you can open it with any web browser. Right-click on the SVG file and open it with your favorite browser. I'm using Firefox, but feel free to use any browser. You can enlarge your plot by zooming in. SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics, which is a file format that you may not have used before. The more common JPEG or PNG file format saves the image as a raster image, meaning that the image is composed of pixels. As you zoom in and enlarge a JPEG or PNG image, the image will lose its quality because all you're doing is making the pixels larger, so you'll eventually end up with large squares for all of your pixels. By contrast, a vector image will keep its image quality regardless of the size. So it's indifferent if the image is displayed on a small screen, like a smartphone, or on a large canvas, like the side of a building. To use the SVG file in a presentation, open your presentation app. I'm using Microsoft PowerPoint, but you could use any app. Create a blank presentation. Change the layout to title and content. Enter the title. Center Justify and Bold. Click to add text. Select the picture icon to add an image. Select your SVG file. Resize it as necessary. In PowerPoint, if you hold down the control key while clicking and dragging, you'll be able to resize the image without moving it. Select the design idea on the right side. Select Reading View to see your slide in action. Go back to the normal view. Save the file as Iris Flower Presentation. Go back to VS Code. Save your file by going to File, Save, or just hit Control S to save. Not too bad, right? Now, you're probably not going to win the Nobel Prize for this analysis, but this quick demonstration should give you an idea of what the analysis process looks like using the Julia programming language. You really didn't need to know anything about programming, or about analysis, or about botany, in order to generate a useful plot that you can use for a presentation. If you go back to VS Code, you'll see that there are hardly any lines of code. In fact, the hardest part of this entire process was adding the packages and waiting for them to pre-compile. This really shows the power of a programming language. The right programming language can help you convert a complex task 
into something that's trivial. Now, just like there's more to programming than just learning Hello World, there's a lot more to computational analysis than simply generating a plot using the Iris Flower dataset. However, for many beginners, this may be enough to get started. You can repeat this process by selecting a different dataset and then displaying it using the VS Code Display function. You can then generate several exploratory plots using Data Voyager, and then you can play around with the different settings. Once you find a plot that you like, simply specify it, and then you can move it to Julia and then save it onto your hard drive. If this is what you can do in Julia without having any knowledge of coding, analysis, or domain, just imagine what you can do if you do know how to code and understand the analysis workflow and have a specific domain expertise. We'll go into analysis and visualizations in a lot more detail in the coming weeks, but hopefully the simple demonstration gives you a taste of what's possible using Julia. Well, that's all for today. Today, we kicked off a brand new series by installing VS Code, adding some packages, and then doing a quick analysis and visualization demonstration using the Iris Flower dataset. Next week, we'll get an overview of analysis and then take a look at some other forms of analysis that don't involve datasets. If you enjoyed this video and you feel like you learned something new, please give it a thumbs up. For more wholesome Julia tutorials, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell. New tutorials are posted on Sundays. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. Please feel free to share these videos since these tutorials are getting rave reviews. Just listen to what the professional reviewers are saying. My disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined.